while for everyone. Takes a while for everybody to come in through the Zoom door. As you find yourself in the webinar today, you'll be able to interact with the chat, maybe start by telling us who you are and where you're from. We love to see who's in the room with us today. And also as you're getting accustomed to the room, we have a Q and A uh, feature for the webinar. So you can find that and know that throughout the recording um, and presentation, you can put your questions in the chat, in the Q and A and we'll address them at the end. Still gonna give a little bit of time for folks to come on into the webinar. It is still just promptly three o'clock here on the East Coast. Thank you, Jay from Albany. And Angelina, we have Florida. Hopefully everyone else has a sunny afternoon in their neck of the woods. We are recording today's session and later uh, on Friday midday, we'll get you a post up. So if you wanted to share this wonderful webinar with others, it will be available. I think I might like to get rolling, um, reminding those who just uh, came in, we're asking people to put their uh, town that they're, or city they're hailing from in the chat, get a sense of who's in the room today. Uh, feel free uh, to put questions into the Q&A as we uh, present. And um, just reminding you, we are recording. My name is Laura Botnelli. I'm executive director of the National Council for the Traditional Arts. And I'm joined with my colleague, Blaine, who will introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Blaine Wade, also um, associate director with the National Council for the Traditional Arts. I see a lot of names in the chat that I recognize from the last few weeks and uh, just really appreciate uh, everybody taking some time out of your day to learn more about the National Folk Festival. Great. Well, we're going to spend a good portion of our time uh, in our National Folk Festival slides uh, learning about our event. So just give us a second to pull those up. Hopefully most of you have seen <laughs> this cover already, uh, which is for the, our, our updated brochure uh, for this recruitment cycle for the National Folk Festival. And as we advance through the slides, you're gonna get to be, see some of the imagery of the event and also um, learn more about the NCTA. So next slide or two. You get to see us looking out over the many cities where the National has been presented. Um, but what most important as we uh, start our conversation today, Blaine and I both are with the National Council for the Traditional Arts, which is a 90-year-old institution that's pre been presenting the folk and traditional arts throughout the United States for many generations. Um, and next slide. So um, the, the, our flagship event, the NCTA's flagship event is the National Folk Festival. It was created, uh, we were founded in 1933, and the first National Folk Festival took place in 1934. And this was a period in American history with the, a lot of New Deal programs, and you were seeing a lot of interest in folk and uh, traditional culture and the proliferation of festivals throughout the country. But what made the National Folk Festival visionary from its get-go when Sarah Gertrude Knott created it um, in St. Louis, Missouri at the time, was that it was the first festival with a multicultural focus, the first festival to look at all the many cultural traditions carried on by cultural communities throughout the country and treat them as all equally contributing to how we thought of the fabric of American culture and identity. And the idea was that that Sarah had, and this was very revolutionary, was that through one event was to bring the finest artists from these different cultural communities all to one event and to celebrate this rich tapestry of American culture by bringing the finest artists from these communities together. And the idea being that these are all artists who grew up and learned these traditions in family settings, community settings. They were passed on through word of mouth or informal teaching. And so these are deeply rooted, deeply traditional artists carrying on the traditions and that 
at any one festival, you can experience many of the traditions you see on the screen here. And we like to say that any one national folk festival is a snapshot of the country at any given point in time. So it's, it's a really wonderful way of understanding and approaching and experiencing American culture. And as we move on to the next slide, you see again a bit more about our founding and the idea was that from the very beginning, the National Folk Festival was a traveling festival. Uh, we were based in St. Louis, Missouri, but the second National Folk Festival was in Dallas, Texas. Uh, it made some trips to Washington, D.C., to Constitutional Hall, back to St. Louis, Missouri. But since its founding, the National has always been a traveling festival. And the big change in our history came in the early 1980s, uh, after a period where the festival was staged at the Wolf Trap uh, National Park for Performing Arts outside of Washington, D.C., we, we took another look at the festival and what it could be and came up with this revolutionary look at how could the festival, if we made it a traveling event that moved to a new host city on a three-year cycle and placed it in downtowns and made it entirely free, how could that become an economic driver and bring people back to downtowns and revitalize downtowns um, while also celebrating all of these cultural traditions and the nation's finest traditional artists in one free event that's completely accessible to the public by being bound downtown. But now we're talking about events that are bringing 175,000 people over the course of a weekend into these downtown spaces where they're spending money and, and benefiting the businesses. And then after three years, what happens is the festival would move on to a new host city. And in this snapshot here, you start to see of the geographic breadth and reach the festival has had. Uh, going to these many places, many of which we've visited since uh, we moved to that three-year model of, of moving on. Now, the other, uh, moving on after three years. Now, the other aspect of the model that's really exciting and interesting, and we'll see more about this on the next slide, is that after the festival moves on, uh, the National is in a city for three years, it moves to the next host city. The idea is it's laying the foundation for a locally produced festival that continues after the National moves to, the, to its next host city. And that by doing this, we're creating events that have long-term impact, um, that become deeply rooted in communities, become transformative for those communities with economic benefits, social benefits, cultural benefits, really showing a community what it can do together all through this economic driver of the festival. And you have longstanding community institutions that really come together with these locally produced events that communities feel an ownership of and carry on after the national moves on. Some of these we stay involved with in different capacities. Others have continued on very successfully as purely locally produced events. But the idea is that through the national year seeding events that continue to have impacts in their host cities for, for years and decades into the future. So here we are uh, in 2023, looking for our next host city. Uh, this city uh, would be presenting the 82nd, 83rd, and 84th National Folk Festivals. Um, the relationship is in partnership with the National Council for the Traditional Arts. Um, we are a 501c3 uh, organization. We're based in Maryland, uh, but we continue uh, to work uh, nationally through the partnerships we maintain. But through the application cycle, the host community is identifying its local stakeholders who are actually becoming the internal leadership of the event um, in the local community. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we go, but this is a, through the application process, we're really meeting um, our future partners for three years and then knowing when the national moves on that those partners would continue um, to support um, a traditional arts event in their, in their community. So our letter of intent um, is due June 30th, and this is a simple indication that you're going to be uh, proceeding through to complete um, the uh, request for proposal um, submission, which is due on August 1st. Um, we, Blaine and I are here um, to help and assist you putting in as strong an RFP as you can. Um, so that way during the fall, um, we can go through our review process and hopefully um, in the winter uh, be announcing our next host city. For many cities, that may mean um, that the 2020, uh, the first festival uh, may or may not be hitting in 2024, uh, but that's something that as you consider your calendar, uh, we also get to talk through and we'll address later in this presentation. Next slide and back to Blaine. Yeah, so we, when we talk about the National Folk Festival, there's different ways we like to talk about it. But one of our 
most meaningful phrases is that the National Folk Festival has something for everyone. Uh, we also say in a very similar kind of vein, it's a move, move, movable feast of the traditional arts. And we talk about something for everyone. What that really means is people can come and have very different experiences at the festival, but all equally meaningful. Uh, people come for all kinds of different reasons, and we want it to be as inclusive and community building event as we can. So some of those defining characteristics of the National Folk Festival, first of all, it's entirely free to the public. And by placing it downtown, centrally located in our host cities, uh, it's also completely accessible to everyone is the, the idea and the intent. And then once somebody's at the festival, the amount of different art forms and experiences available to them is, is really stunning. If you look at the stage performers, the regional folk life area, uh, the, the arts marketplace, food vendors, you're talking about over 350 of the nation's finest traditional artists all together at one free event. Within that, you have all kinds of different experiences at the different festivals, or sorry, the different stages and venues within the festival. Uh, each festival site has between five and seven stages, and there's a mix of experiences as those. We, we always like to say we don't have a main stage, um, and the festival itself is the star. We don't have headliners, but as you'll see later, we've worked with Del McCoury, you've already seen, Mavis Staples, uh, Grandmaster Flash, lots of really well-known artists. But the festival in itself is, is the star, and there's no main stage, but there is a biggest stage. So there's some experiences you'll get rousing performances in very large uh, settings. Uh, we also have a participatory dance tent. People who are passionate about Cajun or Zydeco or square dancing will spend a lot of their uh, festival in that space. Uh, we have smaller, more intimate stages, with have, which have a real sense of immediacy and access to the artists, where you experience virtuosity and a real connection to amazingly talented artists. Uh, we celebrate uh, usually with an open, opening parade. You can actually see one behind me here in Salisbury, Maryland, uh, with tr Treme Brass Band. Uh, so street traditions and parade traditions and presenting these cultural traditions as, traditions as closely as we can to their community contexts. And we also like to bring artists from different backgrounds onto stages together to talk and discuss what they have in common, what may be different. It's all about building bridges to what we have in common, but all kinds of different ways of experiencing these artists. We also have a number of what, so the festival, first of all, it does celebrate the nation's finest artists. It's a national showcase, but each host city is able to inflect, sort of present a sense, a regional sense of place and regional identity in the festival. And that's primarily done with the regional folk life area, which highlights cultural traditions uh, that are specific to the host city, this host state and, and the surrounding region. We have a family area where parents and children can go to experience hands-on and interactive performances uh, to really engage and make it educational, but also fun and active. And then we have for people who like to go and see what they might be able to, to purchase or, or experience, we have a um, hands-on uh, traditionally made crafts in our juried marketplace. And again, the, the culturally diverse food offerings. I can remember reading newspaper articles about people who said they only come to the festival and spend their time in the family area, or really it's more about what kind of different foods they can eat. But many of course come from the music and the dance. So it really is a festival that offers someone for everyone. And if we look at the, the next few slides, uh, there's some more photos that illustrate exactly what I'm talking about. I think up we have, uh, here's the, the regional folk life area uh, at our most recent host city in Salisbury, Maryland. And here you have an Ethiopian coffee ceremony, traditional Cambodian dance, classical Cambodian dance, and crab picking from the signature blue crabs of the Chesapeake Bay uh, in Maryland. So a real snapshot of both longstanding traditions in the region, but also new cultural communities. And that really speaks to the bridge building uh, that comes through and, and how we highlight all these different aspects of the, of, of the host region and state through the folk life area. Uh, then next we have the more on the family area and you get a sense of the connectivity and the interactiveness that happens whether it's uh, Chinese lion dance and, and dragon dance. Um, here's a participatory uh, street drumming, bucket drumming lesson. Basically kids got drumsticks, they got to participate. And just a wonderful photo there of Phil Wiggins who's a National Heritage Fellow, probably the greatest living Piedmont blues harmonica player, hands out harmonicas and gives a harmonica lesson. Where else can you come and get a harmonica lesson for free from Phil Wiggins? Uh, so really wonderful experiences for the kids who get to spend time in the family area. And then uh, lastly, I think we have uh, more photos of uh, food vendors in the marketplace. So again, other kinds of experiences, wonderful foods to eat, wonderful crafts to check out. Again, in Salisbury, you saw a lot of traditional crafts that reflected life on the Eastern shore of Maryland. 
um, both the, the natural world from beaches and the ocean uh, to marshes and what people were making and by drawing on the landscapes. Uh, so all reflected throughout the festival. So it's that's a really good uh, taste and flavor of what the festival is about and truly does offer something for everyone. So you might be imagining how the National Folk Festival would fit into your local event calendar. Um, and one of the first questions we get uh, from cities considering this event is how to pick a weekend. The National does not happen on a singular weekend. It is uh, decided in partnership and collaboration with the host city that both looks at your cultural calendar and event calendar, as well as ours and places within that calendar where the National can have um, a strong impact. It's a rain or shine event. Uh, the stages are all outdoors. We have tented stages. Um, we have uh, been, as you saw from our map, a lot of East Coast experiences and have worked through some heavy, heavy water and rain um, uh, events. Um, but it, the, the free event, we've seen the audience, audiences spring back if the weather's, well, the weather's not well, um, or on the bright sunny weekend, having what has become for most cities, their record setting and sort of capacity setting um, experiences in their downtown. <clears throat> so the, as you prepare and consider an application, um, you don't, if there's a natural space uh, where you know an event like this would bloom, blossom, or potentially fill a need, you should articulate it. Um, but to know that that's an ongoing conversation as we move through um, our review of applicants and the RFPs. Um, it's nice to know when you may be thinking, and also for us to understand um, the capacity of the region um, when it comes to events. We do not want to find ourselves be coming in and creating conflict or competition where men, what we're really trying to do is help to uh, celebrate, develop new partnerships and amplify um, as we can for this three year period, uh, the energies of the community that we're, that we're partnering with. So we move to the next slide. So once you've picked your brilliant sunny day, every day weekend to host the National Folk Festival in partnership with NCTA, um, what comes next are a lot of good things. Um, the National is known and evidenced and documented to be bringing in tens of millions of economic impact uh, to the host community, which we will uh, share more about in a few slides. Um, it's been known to be served as the peak weekend for tourism and hospitality. And this is across demographics from East Coast um, cities like uh, Lowell, Massachusetts and Richmond, Virginia, all the way out to our hosts more recently in uh, Butte, Montana. Record-breaking weekends for local businesses and restaurants, um, the enhanced community outreach, participation, and civic pride that comes together from lifting up something as robust as the national that engages, you know, across community collaborations. Um, that lasting impact um, is really invaluable as you consider the festival. Um, new and lasting investments in infrastructure and event production. Um, we have app examples to follow on capital development that has been triggered directly by the national's tenure. Um, Blaine talked about the regional folk life area, but it honestly it's come as an opportunity for often new ethnographic research, new community research and documentation that deals with who are um, in the life ways of uh, the host city and how are their experiences artistically uh, through their cultural traditions, have they been documented and how can they be presented uh, to be introduced um, and shared uh, more broadly through an event like this. And then uh, festival artists and community members, um, we find collaborating across cultures. Um, are the, the, the experience for the artists with the host city and that special relationship um, from working often very closely with civic leaders and knowing that they're hosting some of the finest um, tradition bearers, uh, celebrated artists nationally and internationally, um, it, it makes a lasting impact um, for our, our festival community and for the community members as well. Uh, next slide. The next question we get most is about the finances of the festival. And it's very important because as you have all here in this room, in some way probably worked in special events and you understand event budgets and how, um, as you imagine, five to seven stages, closing downtown streets, uh, bringing in uh, in excess of 100,000 people in a weekend, what does it take um, financially to make that event possible? The National Folk Festival um, over uh, in a single year for that three day stay, um, we budget at a $1.5 million price tag. Um, and that is um, achievable um, as we found it. And as part of our application criteria, 
is to really understand what is the community um, resource, um, regional, um, state, and then national that could come together. Um, we find from the local level, private foundations, businesses, and individual donors um, with means are often um, see the value and uh, finding investment uh, return from this event. At the state level, the Arts and Humanities Council, tourism offices, bond bills, capital grants, community development and on other legislative directed spending has come to benefit in the national in different ways over its tenure. Um, at the regional level, um, we're seeing again, more private foundations, economic development, rural and urban uh, cooperative agencies, and of course, um, private corporations. Um, at the national level, uh, we find our funding partners at the NEA, NEH, um, private foundations, corporations, more recently, um, the American Rescue Plan funds, um, as we know, benefited uh, many communities through their special event capacity as economic drivers for recovery. And then um, through uh, HUD, we've seen uh, more recent indications that there is support um, in those funding areas. Quite honestly, though, um, a good deal of the money comes in from uh, the sponsorships of the stages um, and presenting sponsorships and sponsorships where businesses or um, community supporters are uh, taking advantage of the naming opportunities uh, that are available on site at the national. And then as any event does, it actually earns money on site while it runs, while it's free to come to the festival. Um, there's food sales, uh, merchandise sales, beverage and vendor sales, and then of course our bucket brigade, which is the on-site uh, fundraising uh, throughout the weekend for soliciting donations from the audience um, to contribute. You'll see some pictures throughout of people with buckets. Uh, that's the bucket for it, brigade. So we can move on to the next slide. So getting a little more uh, in the uh, specifics here, because it does help um, applicants understand, well, what is it that we're bringing forward for collaboration and partnership? Um, how do I get to this 1.5? Is it even possible? Um, so we see the breakdown a different way. Uh, more recently, we've seen um, contributions um, through sponsorship donations and general fundraising uh, being a very, very uh, strong place for investment in the festival. Um, knowing that presenting sponsorships are lifting up corporate brands um, into uh, a very, very uh, uh, visible uh, sector over the, the course of the event. And you can see also how earned revenue on site is, uh, is still bringing in uh, close to a, a quarter of a million uh, to the festival bottom line. In-kind support um, is varies across our festival partners. Um, we might find that there could be public safety support or some other support that's related to um, parking access or um, other charitable means that the community has to offset uh, uh, through volunteerism uh, with the festival um, needs for setup. In-kind support can come lots of different ways and different communities have different resources that are already available to them. And it does affect, it does influence the bottom line of the budget. Um, that's something that we can uh, talk about as applications progress to make sure that what you're envisioning as your income stream for the festival um, would uh, meet the needs of our budget. I should also indicate this money flows through the local community. It is uh, that there's a nonprofit partner um, and these are resources that are solicited by and kept um, and spent within the host community. Of course, we're um, working in partnership to help ensure that that uh, is meeting the deliverables and goals of the festival. Um, but NCTA itself is not the one as, a, as the charity that is uh, bringing through these resources. It actually that they go through the host community. To the next slide where you can see, well, where does that expenditure land? <laughs> um, and I'll just go through the, from top to bottom. Um, so there's administrative overhead uh, related to producing the festival. It typically takes us uh, an 18 month roll up, uh, run up to envision a festival from start to finish, uh, depending on our, uh, the time available, um, but there are hard costs to administration and also the fundraising uh, support for the festival. There's advertising and marketing resources. Uh, we all know we need to be uh, mindful of risk and insurance needs for the festivals. The festival hires um, a local manager and support staff that is supported by this budget. That person is working locally um, on the ground in the host community. Um, there's an artistic programming budget for the artistic fees and travel with the artists. 
And then of course, all of the technical implicate implementations of the festival from staffing to equipment rental um, to supplies on site. Um, there's contractors who are hired um, and regional uh, coordinators to help implement things like food and beverage. Um, and then there's volunteer services and visitor services and special programs, which include accessibility accommodations for the festival um, and a stipend for a volunteer coordinator, knowing that there's, um, as you'll see, um, a very uh, significant volunteer lift for this event. So we'll move on to the next slide. And I think I get to pass it back to Blaine to say, all right, we've just invested and spent $1.5 million. Then what happens? <laughs> right. So obviously, if any community is thinking about taking on um, an effort of this size and magnitude, the real outcomes and benefits are, are key to that decision. And as you can see here illustrated in this graphic, uh, there are really impactful uh, and significant economic impacts. And you know, there's a, a lot we've talked about so far about uh, creating community and representation and, and bringing everybody to make sure an, an event feels like it's their own, but also to get the go ahead to move forward with something like this, you do need to appreciate the economic impacts. And as we always like to say about the National Folk Festival, it is very much an economic driver and it revitalizes downtown um, downtown spaces and businesses. And so what you see here uh, is a graphic from the 79th National Folk Festival in 2019. And the reason we uh, select and use that one is obviously uh, as of 2020 with the onset of COVID, we had to cancel that festival and our festivals in both 2021 and 2022 were slightly smaller due to uh, public health and safety measures as people just came back up and looked at live events. So really the most representative data we have recently is from that festival. And that was the second year of our residency in Salisbury, Maryland. So this is really um, telling and indicative of what a host city can start to expect by the second year of the festival's uh, residency in, in a city or a community. And so we're talking about, in, in terms of investment, a return of $42 for every dollar spent by the host city, which, which is really great. And you can see some of the other uh, spe metrics specific to uh, 2019 in the graphic, but we've also highlighted here some of the more long-term um, cumulative impacts in Salisbury over the festival's full residency. And so we're talking about $65 million in long-term economic impact over the residency in Salisbury. And over the course of that time, 400,000 people came to downtown to attend the festival. Uh, so a huge influx of people and energy and economic activity and just people interacting in community. So it's really a great snapshot of what the festival, what its impacts are uh, it, within one one festival. And then uh, if we go, go ahead to the next slide, we can see some of the long-term infrastructure and development opportunities the festival, festival helps motivate and trigger. Uh, here we have different venues from different host cities. In the top left is LeBauer Park in Greensboro, North Carolina. On, the, on at least my bottom left uh, by the Wicomico River is um, the amphitheater stage amphitheater stage in Salisbury, Maryland. And then the most striking visual, although I think Leo Sandoval, the Afro-Brazilian uh, tap dancer is, is wonderful as well, but uh, the stage in Butte, Montana, which is an old mining community. That's an old mainframe mining shaft. And they turned that into a performance stage. That's the, the largest outdoor stage for the Montana Folk Festival. It's known as the original. Uh, and that's where they have their, their largest evening programs. And in, uh, each of these have been long-term infrastructure developments for the host communities. In Butte, that's part of a large-term a, a large-scale park development. Uh, in Salisbury, the amphitheater has grown to become a key part of community events. First, first uh, outdoor film night Fridays and events like that. And LeBauer Park is fully integrated into Greensboro. It's a wonderful space where families can go and picnic and play ping pong. And there's a mini golf course, uh, but also in this wonderful uh, art, art exhibit that was there at the time, but a, a great performance venue that grew out of the festival uh, being in Greensboro from 2015 to 2017. And it's a key part of the downtown infrastructure now. So these are all impacts. And then I would also quickly highlight in Lowell, Massachusetts, where we've worked since the mid 1980s, uh, out of the festival has grown the Lowell Outdoor Summer Music Series, a huge part of, of what a Lowell summer is like now. And that's all due to um, the festival and, and what it created and, and the energy it brought uh, to downtown Lowell. <clears throat> So one of the next most common questions that we receive um, as especially with our convention and visitor partners is about the, the lodging needs for the national. Um, so we're gonna talk about internal room nights first. Um, so this is our, um, the artists, staff, 
the crew, the vendors that are coming in um, to help build, execute, and take down the event. For the event, a typical three-day weekend, that's a 700 internal room nights, knowing that on Friday and Saturday, our peak night, that we're using about 200 rooms um, to each night to host um, the full group um, of our internal participants. Uh, we need a hotel that has full service catering um, opportunities in order to keep the day and night life cycle of a uh, large free event with people coming in from coast to coast. Um, and we have found that some host communities do end up splitting um, the host hotel over two uh, locations um, if one um, uh, venue is not capable of holding the full cohort. I just want to talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the picture, um, which is the Saturday night jam, <laughs> as you end up creating uh, quite a very interesting group of residents in one location um, can help but to share, create, and cultivate artistic opportunities together. Uh, there's some famous folks there in that photo, and if you spot them, you can put them in the chat. Um, and we'll move on to the next slide when we talk about our external community and the visitors that are coming into town. Um, so again, all sorts of things that could in, 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 uh, be inflection points for what is um, uh, uh, attendance of the National Folk Festival. Uh, looking at the 79th, the 2019 event right before COVID, uh, it was clocked uh, with 150,000 attendees. And in that economic impact report, they specifically, this was done through the Salisbury University Business and Economic Development School, this three years, actually it turned into a five-year study of the national's impact. Um, they were able to see that 40,000 of the visitors stayed at least one night locally uh, through their data, um, through various accommodations, including um, hotels, rentals, and camping. We'll move to the next slide. I think with Belaine, I think the question that uh, we hear a lot um, as people are realizing uh, they, they may like to um, consider putting in an application is, what, how could we be most successful and what makes a successful National Folk Festival? Sure. So. As we look at uh, over the course of our history and what really does add up to making for a successful host, uh, host city as well as a locally produced event, I think one thing that's key is a community that's really looking for, has a vision or a sense of inspiration and a love of it. People who have a real love of where they're from and, and their community and, and what can they do that can bring more life or energy to it or bring a signature event to the community that can really help push it um, and, and bring it new opportunities and really increase the quality of life as it looks to its future and, and improvements. So you, what you really have are efforts driven by people who have real vision and love from for where they're from and what they can do to enhance the quality of life there. And they see in the festival a really a deeply rooted grassroots event that can help achieve that. And that's always been a, a key part in, in making for a successful host city. Another part is, uh, as Laura said, we have a, a primary nonprofit partner, and we'll talk some more about that in a second, but it's also the coalition of partners and having key stakeholders at the table bought into the success of the event. And so it's an event that really depends on having support from local city government, the city administration. We need to close streets. We need infrastructure. We need access to trash removal and water and sanitation, uh, emergency services. So the city has to be on board. It's a free festival with a $1.5 million budget. And it isn't meant for some, it to be something that, that the city is paying for out of pocket. Instead, you need your key corporate um, entities locally on board to be ready and eager to participate as sponsors. You need uh, your key fundraising um, resources in a community on board and, and excited to support it, as well as philanthropic giving foundations, uh, downtown business associations, and people concerned with economic and community development, uh, people concerned with community outreach and how to bring new cultural communities and tie the community more closer together and make sure everybody feels a sense of involvement. And finally, of course, the arts community and culture community is very important. And what's exciting about this model is if you have all these stakeholders bought in, if in each festival, each national folk festival has between five and seven partners who are usually uh, regularly identified in all press releases and on the website, et cetera, uh, but five to key really a coalition of partners. And if you have those different sectors represented and they're all thinking about the festival and what it brings and how the festival meets their goals for what their organization is about, then collectively you start to see how they work together to build from the, the foundation up a successful event. And so that's why it's so important to have all these stakeholders at the table. 
And then finally, it really takes a community that's committed to um, the idea of bringing everybody together about finding ways of uh, saying what we have in common. It's going back to what I was saying earlier about Sarah Gertrude Knott and the founding of the event in the 30s. What's really amazing and inspiring about the NCTA and the National Folk Festival is this consistent through line across 90 years of what our work's about. And it's still very much about the vision Sarah had. And it, it's so much more about identifying what we have in common. And that's hopefully what the festival comes in and does is builds bridges within a community. Um, and makes a community stronger by partnering together on the event. So uh, to go back to having everybody at the table, you see sort of not everybody on this list would need to be a partner, but this is a pretty good snapshot of, of your key potential festival partners. Of course, first we have the nonprofit partner. That's the that's the those are the folks who sign the contract with the with the NCTA to do the National Folk Festival. They hire the local manager. That becomes who we interact with most regularly on a day to day basis. They're responsible for fiscal management of the event as well. Uh, we've had nonprofit partners who are downtown economic development organizations, arts organizations, a downtown entertainment district, uh, a Main Street program. So all from different aspects of 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 the community, but concerned with economic and arts activity in downtown spaces. Um, and again, uh, you see you, the need for having city administration and others uh, involved there. Tourism, it's very important to have tourism and a convention and visitors bureau on because the festival can be very much about uh, increasing tourism to a location. Universities have often been uh, key partners. We've done residencies. We've done programs on campus. That's key to volunteering. It builds bridges between uh, town and gown and those kinds of ideas. And then finally, I'd like to flag the National Park Service. Uh, the NCTA has had a cooperative agreement with the National Park Service for about 50 years. Uh, it's not necessary for a, park or a par national park to be involved or nearby, but it's definitely uh, helpful. And it's something that is attractive. Uh, because then we can bring to bear our relationship with the National Park Service and having them involved as a partner is always very helpful. Um, but, but again, not necessary, but it, it is, a, it is a, a nice thing to see when it's possible. Um, and there's other aspects moving on to the next slide of how this is an event that really is created and um, achieved by the community. It requires a thousand volunteers uh, to pull off the National Folk Festival. Everything from the Bucket Brigade, which you see here, which is a key fundraising. They walk, this is a group of people who are with buckets. And even though it's a free event, we have regular ask, we encourage donations. Uh, it's a wonderful way of uh, participation. And I think a, a really interesting point about the National is it's also a great example of uh, volunteerism and civic engagement, community service. So it really takes all forms of the community to come together and contribute uh, to make it happen. Um, and one other thing that's not highlighted here, but I wanted to touch on briefly, so much of our work on the festival is done with community uh, committees, advisory committees. We have committees from marketing and fundraising and the programming of the festival and an executive steering committee and a volunteer committee, et cetera, et cetera. So all kinds of different uh, voices and opportunities to participate in the festival from the community at a grassroots, grassroots level are there. So it really is an event that involves the entire community and it just creates this wonderful sense of what the community can achieve when everyone works together. And then uh, looking at one final slide on this particular um, aspect of our presentation is again, this idea that we're trying to make it feel like it's a festival that's reaching out to all different groups in a community and offering something uh, for everyone. Uh, and so one of the first things we do when we start working with a new community is trying to get a sense of who are some of the new cultural groups who have been coming in, what have been some of the new immigration or, or settlement uh, trends a community has been seeing. So in a place like Salisbury, Maryland, you saw, uh, we saw Haitian, a significant Haitian presence, South Korean presence. So we brought in a great South Korean dance ensemble. We brought in Vukman Experience, a Haitian uh, roots music group. And we even developed specific marketing materials in Haitian Creole that were able to be distributed and, and as a form of outreach to encourage that community to come. And they did. They were there enthusiastically at all of Bukman's performances. Uh, we also try to really stress that when we talk about a folk and traditional arts festival, we're talking about a festival that includes so much that people don't immediately associate. We're talking about Grandmaster Flash and hip hop or go-go uh, break dancing. And so it's really trying to appeal to a broad representation of the community. And um, a place like Lowell, Massachusetts, where if you look at its uh, immigration patterns over generations, at one period, you're talking Greek and Armenian. So we still have to pr program Greek and Armenian music, but we're also now trying to program Afghanistan, music from Afghanistan because you have a growing Af Afghani population. So it's always that with that in mind to try to build community and bring everybody into the event. 
Great. So I think we've okay. just got a few more slides left. Yeah, uh, so then um, uh, Blaine was just talking about our legacy festivals. He mentioned Lowell, Massachusetts, and we do have a continual role with uh, several, but not all of our more recent uh, partners. And what you're seeing here on this uh, uh, lineup, um, starting at the top where we have just concluded our tenure um, in Salisbury, Maryland, and the Maryland Folk Festival is launching this year. Um, our colleagues in North Carolina uh, are successfully running the North Carolina Folk Festival. Uh, the Montana Folk Festival uh, in early July um, is a very signature event in the Montana cultural calendar. We'll give a peek more about that in a moment. Um, Richmond Folk Festival, uh, we will uh, also <laughs> have a little bit more to share about. Uh, but then as we look down um, and you see that some festivals do have a natural lifespan. The American Folk Festival was a tremendously successful and impactful, uh, I guess it uh, 18 year run um, up there in Bangor, Maine, um, but ultimately was uh, a very uh, important uh, cultural, economic and event development opportunity. Um, and uh, but eventually uh, did um, uh, close. So as you are envisioning the trajectory of the national in your community, you have to look out over a decade, um, knowing that the impacts of these locally produced festivals are also continuing to generate tens of millions of dollars of economic impacts. So as we move to the next slide, um, we have two success stories from just the last season, uh, 2022, which brought the Montana Folk Festival back from a two year hiatus due to COVID. They just were at that moment in the calendar where we lost a, uh, two full seasons. Um, and in 2022, um, the economic impact was measured at $31 million annually. Um, and this is a quote from um, our colleague at, uh, in, in uh, the great state of Montana. Uh, we're identifying that $300 million that would have normally bypassed the region for other tourist destinations came into uh, Butte and the surrounding regions because the Montana Festival um, continues to operate um, uh, in mid-July. Um, for Richmond, um, we had a fabulous weekend in Richmond, Virginia, along the James River with uh, record setting uh, 230,000 attendees, uh, or possibly more, it's hard to count, and uh, the Bucket Brigade, the indicators of success coming through for two of the on-site revenue drivers, $125,000 in those donation buckets. That is not a typical run, um, but that also indicates the potential after 18 years of producing an event, what is a high water mark um, and knowing to be able to be uh, seeing those types of um, on-site sales. When you look at uh, the beer sales on site, you can imagine it was really a fabulous weekend um, that uh, over 500,000 of earned revenue was generated on site. Now, Blaine, as you uh, wanna recap with Richmond, I'll pass it back to you. There's a lot um, as, a, as an example of a very successful run um, with the Legacy Festival. Yeah, and I mean, the numbers uh, for Richmond are, are really amazing to see. It's, it's impressive, but uh, it's also a great example of the intangible benefits of what uh, of this festival can bring to a community. The 2022 Richmond Folk Festival was named uh, Richmonders of the Year by the local uh, independent weekly newspaper. And what people in Richmond like to say about the festival is it's the best thing the city has ever done. I think if you if you go to the biggest stage outside, there's a banner at the top that says like Richmond at its best. But what people always say about it is the best thing that Richmond ever done. So that has ever done. So it's a really wonderful little snapshot that encapsulates how the National Folk Festival in, in its host communities can completely reimagine what a city thinks about itself and what it thinks is possible when everybody is pulling in the same direction to achieve a goal at this very grassroots level is it ultimately becomes transformative for the community and how it thinks about itself. And uh, it's, it really captures what the National is all about very succinctly. So now just to close out our presentation with a few very important pragmatic details. Um, revisiting our, our deadlines on the next slide. Again, um, if you are plan to submit um, a proposal, the first uh, deadline to keep in mind is on June 30th. There'll be a, a letter of intent uh, that we'll need. Um, not a lot there. It's just, uh, again, stating the intent to apply. And then on August 1st, uh, that's when the proposals are due to us. And you see a little bit more about um, what makes for a successful proposal. It's again, that idea of having everybody at the table, having that buy-in 
um, so we can start to see a strong foundation for the event and that at the time of the proposal, an applicant will have one third of the festival budget uh, known to the host community. So we get a sense moving forward. And I think this is also very reassuring for anybody putting forward a proposal for something like this, uh, that there's a good foundation to work from when it comes to, to fundraising and, and raising the budget. Uh, throughout the process leading up to June 30th and August 1st, uh, Laura and I are available. We're going to put our email addresses in the chat uh, here before the webinar is over. And uh, definitely, as you're thinking about your proposal, please be in touch, reach out. We would love to answer questions and uh, help guide you through that process. So I think uh, with that, we're going to be putting some key links and resources in the chat. Uh, so keep an eye on that. And uh, we're ready to take some questions that are in the, the Q&A section, I believe. Great. Right. Give us a second to catch up if you've been chatting at us <laughs> while we've been presenting. All right, Blaine. Do you want to? Let's. No, uh, there's. Sorry. Oh, uh, go ahead. Um, I see a question from Heather Lyons about the smallest city that you believe could uh, successfully host this event. Blaine, you've. Uh, I'll pass that to you as we. Sure. Um. You know there is no black and white clearly defined right answer uh, we've worked uh both butte and bangor i believe are somewhere in the mid 30 thousands uh salisbury is not far from there but if you look at the larger metropolitan region of salisbury uh, it's quite larger than that i, I do think a, a sort of a key marker we're trying to keep in mind is probably around fifty thousand. But um, within that, there can be great variability. It can be a smaller community that's near a metropolitan area. It could be a smaller community that has strong corporate support because something is located there that has a history of giving to events. Um, there could be a strong history of fundraising. So uh, I think in that 40 to 50,000 range is a good marker, but be in touch with us and reach out if you have questions because with any answer like that, there's always some specifics that may uh, impact impact how we answer that differently. It's really about the specifics of the community. And so on the same side, the cap blade, you know, where we see the where the national is fitting in at the top side of the population. <clears throat> sure. Um, you know, I think what's key there is the national has always done best in uh, communities where it becomes the signature event. So if it's a community that already has um, a signature event, uh, then it, it probably isn't uh, the right match for the national. I think, boy, what that means uh, on the top end, we've worked in cities, if you're looking at metropolitan area, uh, over half, of, easily over half a million um, and, and upwards of that. I mean, if you think about Greensboro and Richmond, those are some of the bigger communities we've worked in. Um, so, I, but I think the key consideration is where does the event fit within the ecosystem of events in a community and would it be the signature event? Because uh, that's usually where it, where it does best to get that community support and uh, buy-in it needs. All right, I'll take a few of these where uh, from Jay, he asks, uh, or they ask, as we know, costs have increased across the board. How have costs been increased, been factored, been into, have cost increases been factored into this estimate? Yes, Jay. <laughs> now there are there's been volatility in many of the cost points for the national. This year we actually um, the it had been a price range um, previously that was we'll say 1.3 to 1.5. We've leaned into the um, top side of that estimate um, and have dealt with travel increases, rental increases in four festivals in 2022 that helped us come up with those numbers. Now, um, those are, an, an, again, initial estimates. Each community has different cost drivers, uh, whether it's a, you may be working in a union shop, which changes the um, uh, payroll um, and employee requirements significantly. So, um, but yes, with it, in relationship to our work um, at four major festivals in 2022, we use those um, to help us uh, prepare the uh, budget that you saw just earlier in the slides. Um, I'll go to Rachel, if that's okay, where she asks if we sell alcohol and we uh, do uh, have a uh, beer and wine or other spirits line um, for on-site revenue um, in our projected budget. Um, that each community has its own, obviously, strict ABC considerations, uh, alcohol laws, and can be 
uh, obviously worked on very early to understand how those types of sales can potentially benefit the festival budget, or if there's limitations um, where other on-site revenue may need to be explored. Blaine, anything you want to share about either of those responses? Move on to no, the next. I think, I think that's. Um, I think you've covered it all. Right. Rain locations. What about rain location alternatives? So, Blaine, do you want to talk about the weather? Yes. Uh, so, uh, the National of the Rain or Shine event. Our, our long-term technical director likes to say you plan for rain and hope for sun. Um, so when with, then within uh, each festival, you, we have a mix of tinted and open air stages. So our first option, if weather gets such that the open air stages are no longer enjoyable or you know we have to be mindful of also the, the equipment, the, state, the back line and electricity on stage. But um, if we have to start thinking about closing down, again, it's a rain or shine event, but if we have to start thinking about closing down some of the uh, stages, what we do is start we concentrating the performances and revising the schedule in the moment to put things uh, beneath the, the tinted stages um, and then sort of adjust from there. A couple of festivals have had uh, alternative rain locations where maybe something could be moved indoors. That does not happen a whole lot. Uh, it's more about um, having the ability to move things around and make use of the tinted venues as much as possible if weather starts to dictate that to us. Blaine, you started to kind of go to Jill uh, Lackey's question about the different stages being spread out in locations in the city, but not on the same street or park area. Um, so this is a walkable event. So you should be able to take in the experience of the national within uh, your foot traffic. That does often extend into adjacent adjoining parking lots, um, uh, park lands, or other spaces that are within that reach. Um, so, but we typically would not want to see the festival sort of broken um, across something that couldn't be traversed by foot. Blaine, is there anything else that you'd want to share? Yeah, I think within sort of the program, the experience of the artistic program and the flow of the schedule, one of the reasons we like the festival to be like that is the idea is that you might be at one stage watching an amazing blues performance and you're having a great time, but you're ready to go check out something else. And we always want people to be within a 10 minute walk, maybe a little more, maybe a little less from getting to that next opportunity. Uh, we pride ourselves on having a very... Uh, there's not a lot of dead time in our schedule. We usually do 15 to 20 minute changeovers between performances. And so also the idea is that if you see a performance to the end and you don't want to stay at that stage and wait through the changeover, again, you've got to only walk 10 minutes or so to get to the next performance. And then within that space, we also like to include things for people to do, whether it's the marketplace or food vendors. The idea is that there's always something engaging for the audience. So people feel like they're always in the middle of it. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons we built the site that way. Yeah. And creating that connective tissue and all those places where you can activate existing aspects of those smaller spaces between the bigger spaces is really an exciting part of the development and partnership with the city. Um, Blaine, uh, Kathleen asked, who is responsible for securing infrastructure, production, and performances? And I'll say a lot of that actually falls in NCTA's plate. Uh, Blaine, do you want to speak to first the artistic programming and then we can get to the other two? <clears throat> yeah, and I think as the conversation goes, we'll be putting a document in the chat that outlines the partnership and what the nonprofit partner is responsible for, what the NCTA is re responsible for. Uh, but the NCTA, and specifically, I, I lead up a lot of this effort uh, related to the artistic program uh, in close collaboration and regularly meeting with an advisory programming committee that's made up of different cultural community leaders, knowledgeable music people within a community, different stakeholders, festival partners. Um, we present ideas, a committee gives us feedback. That's kind of how the program comes together. But in terms of contracting with the artists, uh, reaching out to the artists, putting all that in place, that's on the NCTA's plate. We also hire um, all the production crews. Um, we have worked with um, many of the same people for years and years and years. We have wonderful crews who love coming to our events and are really great at working from artists from all these different cultural backgrounds. So we handle nearly all of the production aspects as well. Um, would you like to, what else is in the question, Laura? Um, things about infrastructure. So when we're dealing with like public works and the actual physical um, necessity of the site, we work in tandem um, mostly with uh, city agencies, public 
uh, safety officials um, for a full technical review design and implementation strategy? And then what are those infrastructure um, elements that need to be, whether we may be coordinating something because it's affecting um, a stage venue where the city might be coordinating something because it's affecting say, you know, parking resources or public safety related to um, the other in infrastructure developments um, going on in the city, curbing. <laughs> Um, the opportunity that the national um, often brings for those types of uh, for just pedestrian safety when you have this many folks, um, it is and that that type of thing falls obviously to the city and the local municipality. Um, so infrastructure uh, really is just a blended piece. Um, and, what? Oh, and what I would add there is especially as you think of it as a learning curve from year one to year three, um, we have a lot of experience here and we are uh, here as a resource. Uh, throughout the residency. So even those parts that maybe fall more on the, the host community's plate, if those are areas where um, there is a learning curve or some support is needed, the NCTA is fully there throughout. Um, so it's never, you're never there without a net, um, but there is a really good uh, breakdown of the responsibilities in that document as well. So I'm gonna to go to Amy's question about the uh, what needs to be secured uh, by the August 1st deadline. And your question reads to clarify, we need to have $500,000 secured by August 1, correct? So what we need to know is there's an indication of that level of capacity um, in the community through an identified partner. Um, no one is expecting us to have um, a, a pledge package uh, with those types of numbers fully articulated. But we would like to understand from your community where you would see that uh, that uh, investment coming from. Some places they know the private foundations um, use these opportunities to leverage all types of community impacts. And it's a very compelling um, uh, opportunity to bring forward. There could be uh, corporations that are making those types of large investments. At the state level, um, we certainly know that there are um, whether it's through tourism, community development, and other legislative directives, some of that early money um, is often identified um, at those state level um, uh, uh, commitments. So um, we know that there is uh, sometimes a, it, it's, it's an obstacle, um, that first uh, uh, piece that helps illustrate where the, um, the funding will um, uh, grow from. And we would like um, if there's a community that, is, that needs to have a, a, a follow-up conversation to help from what we've identified related to some different state political opportunities, different different regional cooperatives um, that are more likely or less likely to be supporting folk and traditional arts or even live cultural productions. Um, from our experience working nationally, we have a sense of which states and which regions um, where funding has been coming from in the past. Um, so we'd like to help you hopefully um, add to uh, what might be an initial um, uh, understanding of where some of those resources would come from. Blaine, do you wanna share any more about that? No, I, I, think, I think that covered most of it. The, the general idea is I think coming into the proposal is each of you know who in your community are the key corporate or philanthropic or uh, other aspects we identified um, in in the part where Laura spoke to the budget or maybe again at the state level and starting to get almost even like soft commitments in those areas where where you have a sense of well if this moves forward I know so and so is on board and they are excited about this and ready so that the dominoes can fall into place to get to that those first benchmarks quickly. So now I'll go back to Jay's question and they ask how do you choose a date that does not compete with the legacy festivals to maximize attendance. That is part of the, the Rubik's Cube of determining where on the calendar um, we can uh, build a, a successful new partnership. Um, the NCTA has its commitments. The host community already has its commitments. You know, that we have a broad sweep of national geography, um, but we also have sort of the, the people that come together to, uh, for us to be deliver what we promise with the national, you know, we have to uh, assure we're not overlapping and um, extending ourselves beyond what we're capable of. Um, so you see the dates of the legacy festivals on the calendar. And what I would actually encourage you to do, and my colleague um, can put the link in the chat to our calendar of events, 
is what those legacy festivals at that moment, I think, can serve best, especially if you look at the dates, is whether you can experience one of them this season. Um, what we have found um, is being able to see um, the fabric of the event, the way it's uh, leveraging the downtown spaces, meeting with festival partners and other, your peer in the community that now hosts an event like this, um, and understanding uh, what would be um, an opportunity early on um, as you uh, go through this proposal process. Um, Blaine, as we think about the date question, um, and especially with the legacy festivals. Um, I mean, festivals change their dates too. Um, in the course of the Nationals residency in Salisbury, we had a date change uh, because of a sort of a change of the local um, event calendar. So it's um, while we hope that we're securing an event weekend that will hold for the three year residency, you know, it's, you know, we lived through a lot in the past five years to know that <laughs> um, there could be an additional consideration. <clears throat> Yeah, no, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, again, it's it's really about comparing calendars, and, and as much as much as we have to be careful about not stepping on our um, other festival commitments, and some of them in a very real way we can't step on because we can't be in two places at once. Um, we haven't figured that part out yet. Um, we also want to be very mindful of what the existing important events are in a, a possible host city, because the last thing we want to do is come in and, and schedule a festival and find out we're in conflict with something that uh, is important to a local cultural group or community or the city at large. And we've already made enemies with half the city. Uh, we've already shot ourselves in the foot in terms of what we're trying to do. So it's a very careful negotiation and process that we want to make sure um, goes as smoothly for our workflow, but also for the relationships we're trying to build and that our partners are trying to maintain uh, in the host communities. And um, and one thing I'd also just encourage you as you say, uh, considering to submit the RFP or knowing that this is a really amazing event to learn about and every three years um, when it's not the middle of a pandemic, um, we are in um, a cycle for our host city rotation. Um, and sometimes it takes multiple application cycles um, for an interested city to mature into a proposed city or even a selected city. So if this is your first encounter with us and you're really beginning to identify, well, what is behind the National Folk Festival, its mission, its approach, it's the way it engages cultural communities, um, that, you know, if an outcome is that you uh, explore a methodology and, and know that there's something that you can achieve uh, locally that um, meets similar goals, that's fantastic. Um, we know there is a large events and cultural fabric of uh, folk and traditional arts many existing events that are trying to come back um, from uh, the, the uh, fluctuations of the past few years, and also many, many sort of leadership changes that are going on um, within communities that have held longstanding events for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and trying to figure out, well, what would be the piece that would help this, you know, become the next thing? Um, Lowell Folk Festival, um, before the National was there, had been um, a festival that was showcasing the diverse regional cuisine of the, I think at that time, 50 immigrant communities to Lowell. Um, and so it's not unheard of um, that this can be part of an evolution and maybe as even as we meet you today may take several years. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate your questions. <clears throat> Are there others we did? Pretty well, anything else in the chat we should be aware of? And uh, have we added our email addresses yet? I saw mine, thank you. Oh. Thank you to our staff. Oh, thank um, you. The NCTA is, as I mentioned, we're based a nonprofit organization. We're based in Maryland, Silver Spring. Um, many of our staff are on the other side um, and you uh, work closely with them through all aspects of not only our application process, but if, uh, we reach that point um, to conversations for the implementation of the festival. Um, it's a very dedicated group of folks um, and, and having produced events for nearly 90 years across the country, um, it, uh, it'd be always exciting to be looking for new partners into the SC NCTA community. So it's great to see the participants here today. Um, Blaine, um, as we wrap up, anything else we need to add? And the deck, yes, the deck is in the chat. One of our colleagues will be, we'll put it back um, into the chat at the bottom. So it turns up. 
Um, and we also uh, will be making available the recording on Friday afternoon, and we can have a PDF to our slide deck um, made available at that time too. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I want to, uh, just to make sure we want uh, the slideshow is a, a great thing to show uh, potential uh, sponsors at this early stage, the recording we've uh, sent around the brochure. Um, if you go to YouTube on our YouTube channel, we have a playlist of videos that highlight different aspects of the national. I think there's a lot of stories embedded there that would be really appealing. And then as we get into working with a specific host city, we're very involved in helping to prepare uh, what becomes a very specific um, pitch deck to sponsors that breaks down what a stage sponsor costs, what an area sponsor costs, and what, what a sponsor gets for that as well uh, so that we have a lot of um, information from past host cities and then we'll update that so we're very involved in that process um, as we get into actually raising the money and uh, bringing on sponsors for a for a national folk festival in a new host city well the last thing i think i'll add is uh we do have uh, actual paper collateral so if you want to request anything um a number of brochures uh sent to your community uh you can email us at our addresses or at festivals at ncta-usa.org um we'd be happy to get them out so people can start flipping through them um, and answer the questions that come up so it's been a nice afternoon with you thank you um enjoy your time perusing the materials we look forward to hearing from you again soon thank you